before we start, um, so that y'all can rearrange your notebooks while I give my um, introductory sentences, uh, the order that I'm going to do these in are molecular and cell biology, perioperative problems, imaging and special studies, infections, and joints. And I don't know what order y'all have them in the book, but that's the order we're going to go through them. Uh, for, for time purposes. Um, the other thing you're going to notice is that there are more slides in your handout than I'm going to be giving in the talk. Um, I had a college friend who was an Air Force pilot and he told a story about flying his plane from somewhere in South Carolina up to somewhere in Rhode Island and they talked to their traffic controllers who apparently uh, fire directions off like they're coming out of a machine gun and his co-pilot was from South Carolina and when they gave him these instructions he um, got on his radio and said um, you know I'm from Aiken, South Carolina and I write just about as fast as I talk uh, would you mind slowing down and giving me the directions um, a little slower and they came back on and said okay good buddy here we go. Well, I couldn't talk as fast as the number of slides that were originally in the presentation, so there will be a few fewer slides that you will notice. As um, Mark um, pointed out, I am primarily a clinician, not a basic scientist. For about five years, I've been coordinating the basic science education uh, at MCV in Richmond. Uh, but any basic science you hear from me, you can read in instructional course lectures or in the Academy Basic Science book. Uh, none of the material that you get from me today is going to be original um, from me. And so this is a group of talks that are a bit different from what I'm used to doing. Um, and so as the cartoon says, um, I may have a bad feeling about um, about this. Um, in molecular and cell biology, the um, central dogma is that information in DNA is transmitted through RNA and converted into proteins. DNA serves as a template for RNA that's called transcription. RNA serves as a template for protein synthesis called translation. And most of you will have had this in college, I'm sure. Uh, the basic structure of DNA is it is a polymer of deoxyribonucleotides. Uh, there are two strands wrapped in a double helix, probably the sentinel biological discovery of this century. Uh, in humans, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. It amounts to over 6 million base pairs. Chromosomes are composed of genes. Genes are felt to encode a single protein. The basic structure um, we all know is the Watson and Crick uh, double helical structure. It basically is a sugar phosphate backbone which has base pairs which are bonded with hydrogen bonds. Um, and that is something that in basic science questions is often um, asked. A chromosome is a single DNA molecule containing hereditary information. It's located in the nucleus. A gene is a segment of chromosomal DNA that gets transcribed to encode a single protein. Uh, not every gene in your chromosome is transcribed. A nucleotide is a sugar molecule strand plus one of the um, four nitrogen bases. The nucleotide is the individual building block of DNA. It's formed of a phosphate group, um, a carbon sugar, two prime deoxyribose, and one of four bases, guanine, adenine, cytosine, or um, thymine, which are um, paired with each other so that adenine and thymine are always paired and guanine and cytosine are always paired. Uh, the, the basic function of all of this is protein synthesis. Proteins are polymers of amino acids. Primarily they catalyze um, nearly all biologic reactions and also serve as structural proteins. 
A codon is a triplet of nucleotides which specify a single amino acid. And the protein is this group of a chain of different amino acids. The protein that is formed is a function of the set of genes that's transcribed. And not every gene is transcribed or expressed so that the basic function depends not on what genes are present but which genes are transcribed. Um, and only a small fragment of, or a small number of genes actually get transcribed of the ones that actually exist. DNA functions to accurately self-replicate itself during cell division. It functions to transcribe messenger RNA and it regulates both of those processes. Cell division is looked at in a couple of ways, the old classic way, the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase that you studied in college, which eventually takes a single cell and makes it into two cells. This can be measured, the DNA content of this process can be measured with a process called flow cytometry, which again is a subject that is popular on the test. Um, the um, other way to look at the cell phase, which currently seems to be a bit more popular, is broken down into basically S phases and M phases with G1 and G2 separating them. During the S phase, the amount of DNA um, is um, being doubled, and during the M phase, um, cell division actually occurs. That can be measured on flow cytometry. Uh, the cells in the G phase are increasing the total amount of um, protein. Uh, the S phase cells um, form a smaller trough. And then in M phase, there is a second peak in the amount of um, DNA per cell. This is useful in looking at tumors. Um, a normal pattern shows the um, usual diploid peak with the smaller peak um, during M phase. And in an aneuploid pattern, which is seen in many tumors, there will be peaks which are where they shouldn't be. And that can be measured by labeling the cells and passing them basically through a cell counter. Um, and again, this is something that, that is often asked. Usually the question is pretty easy and that they ask if you've basically ever heard of flow cytometry. Uh, DNA replication defects um, are called mutations um, uh, and translocations. A mutation is an aberration of a DNA sequence. Um, a missense mutation is a, a mutation where it's a change of the codon to amino acid that's not functionally equal. Another question that they like is osteogenesis imperfecta which is a missense mutation in the alpha-2 chain of type 1 collagen. I'm sure Dr. Chabra talked to you yesterday about type 1 being the common collagen in bone. And so a defect in type 1 collagen leads to a defect um, in the bone, and in this case to fragility and fractures. Translocations also are commonly asked about. The classic translocation is the T1122 translocation in Ewing sarcoma. Um, it's seen in other small round cell tumors such as mesenchymal chondrosarcoma and small cell osteosarcomas. And this has in recent years been a very popular subject um, to ask about in terms of um, genetic abnormalities. There are somatic mutations and germ cell mutations. Uh, somatic mutations occur in diploid cells and consequently are not passed on from generation to generation. On last year's end training, there was a question about the mutation in the GAS protein and fibrous dysplasia, which is a somatic mutation that would be expected to occur in the individual involved, but not in any progeny. Germ cell mutations, on the other hand, occur in haploid cells and are passed on from generation to generation. The classic is hemophilia, which is a sex-linked recessive um, process. Um, achondroplasia, though, uh, is a commonly asked um, question now, which is a sex-linked dominant um, mutation. RNA 
has a hydroxyl group, not a hydrogen group. Um, and consequently, it's not deoxyribonucleic acid um, is where the DNA comes from. Uh, it re uracil replaces thymine and adenine in the hydrogen bond. It's single-stranded, not double-stranded, and it's transcribed um, through um, several different enzymes called RNA polymerases. There are several, many more than this in actual types of RNA. The commonly um, quizzed types of, RN of RNA are ribosomal RNA, which is the most abundant. It's contained within the ribosomes, which are basically the um, protein assembly factories, and it coordinates the assembly of amino acid chains into protein. Messenger RNA ferries the code for um, the protein's amino acid sequence in the nucleus to the site of protein synthesis in the cytoplasm. Transfer RNA interprets the code on messenger RNA and delivers the appropriate amino acid to the protein chain. Techniques of molecular biology um, are coming questions. They've not been as commonly asked at this point on in-trainings as some of the other things, but are um, now widely being written in the treatises on this, and I think will become questioned um, reasonably soon, if, if not very soon. In restriction digestion, the DNA is cut into specific uh, fragments uh, through endonucleases so that those fragments can be worked with. An agarose gel electrophoresis, the negatively charged phosphate group, is used as it causes a migration to the um, positive pole of the electrophoresis and the um, DNA fragments can be um, separated by, um, by size, basically. DNA ligation is another means of um, uh, cutting the DNA, taking a specific fragment, and moving it through a plasmid um, vector in order to um, study it. Genomic libraries and library screening uh, are used to um, collect, amplify, and search for um, known specific um, DNA sequences. Recombinant DNA is um, a subject that is liked. Um, basically, what occurs is that an organism's DNA is extracted. It is cut into fragments. Uh, it is then placed into a plasmid vector. A plasmid is extrachromosomal DNA and is then passed on to um, future cells and can thus um, be isolated and studied. Transgenic animals are animals in which a specific gene has um, been inserted again to evaluate the function of it. Southern blotting is used to identify DNA sequences and northern blotting is used to identify RNA sequences uh, used in um, viral um, microbiology, um, for instance, with HIV. And polymerase chain reaction is a method where um, the um, DNA can basically be denatured by heating and then using an enzyme called TAC polymerase, TAQ, uh, can be repetitively um, replicated so that large amounts of um, specific DNA sequence can be found and um, worked with. Uh, Mendelian genetics. Um, uh, are something that is asked every year. Uh, autosomal dominant um, ge genetic patterns generally create structural defects. Uh, a heterozygous um, individual is positive. Only one um, uh, gene of the two is needed. Half of offspring are affected. There is no gender preference, and I think earlier I had achondroplasia is sex-linked. It's an autosomal dominant um, defect. Multiple heritable exostoses is um, an autosomal, autosomal dominant defect that is commonly asked about. It is, for one reason or another, uh, very popular on the test. Uh, Spondyloepiphyseal um, dysplasia, Marfan syndrome, 
Ehlers-Danlos, and some forms of um, osteogenesis um, imperfecta as well. Um, we're getting, fortunately, out of some of the true basic science, which I hope, and into a little more clinical stuff, which I hope will be easier to um, tolerate. Um, autosomal recessive um, tend to be biochemical or enzymatic defects. Um, one has to be homozygous positive or have both of the um, genetic um, sequences to show the syndrome. Parents are not usually affected as opposed to autosomal dominance, half the parents would be effective, uh, affected. 25% of offspring have these defects and there's no sex preference. Um, sickle cell anemia, osteogenesis two and three, hypophosphatasia, hereditary vitamin D rickets is one that they tend to like to ask about, diastrophic dysplasia and metaphyseal chondrodysplasias um, are examples of autosomal recessive defects. Um, X-linked dominant and X-linked recessive defects likewise occur. In X-linked dominant, uh, the um, defect is passed on to half the sons and daughters by the affected female. Hypophosphatemic rickets tends to be the one that they're interested in. X-linked recessive, uh, the female uh, transmits the gene to 50% of the daughters who serve as carriers and are not clinically effective, but the sons, 50% um, are affected. Uh, Spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, hemophilia, um, and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy are the um, popular questions now. Hunter's syndrome of the mucopolysaccharidoses is um, passed on as an X-linked recessive trait as well. And some of these things you just have to memorize some of them. It seems to show up at least one of them on in-training every year um, and um, just sort of have to memorize that stuff. Immunology um, represents the um, capacity of the body to respond to foreign antigens. Um, priming is a situation where uh, you get an enhanced response during a first exposure as the exposure goes on. The body can retain memory so that a second response will have an even greater enhanced response and allows the body to discern, discern itself from um, foreign antigens. An antibody basically is an immunoglobulin. It circulates in the blood and permeates the body fluids. It binds to antigens, it can block receptor binding and mark a cell for destruction and can activate the complement complex which also serves to um, destroy cells. In cell-mediated immunity, specialized cells react with an antigen on the cell surface or secrete a chemical that attracts macrophages to destroy the cell. Uh, T and B cell development uh, go through different phases. The T cells um, form in the thymus and represent the cells of cell-mediated immunity. B cells um, uh, develop in the um, lymphatic tissues um, and um, the extra lymphatic hematopoietic tissues. Uh, in birds, there is a bursa of fibricious that they develop in that doesn't exist in humans, and they are responsible for um, antibody response um, as opposed to cell-mediated immunity. There are two types of T cells. Uh, the cytotoxic or killer T cell um, directly kills involved cells. Helper T cells um, enhance the response of um, other cells. And this was determined in experiments where the thymus was removed, but all of the cell-mediated immunity wasn't, um, wasn't resolved. Uh, um, and, um, they were able to determine the, the role of helper T cells. B cells produce an antibodies. The final differentiation is plasma cell, which we bump in clinically in multiple myeloma, and we actually measure the immunoglobulins that the cells um, produce. 
Um, B cell activation uh, occurs when the cell uh, reacts to an antigen. It makes and then secretes antibodies to that act antigen. One gets a primary response, which gets enhanced during the primary response. And with a secondary response, there's memory to that antigen, which lasts a variable amount of time, um, often forever, but, but sometimes decades, in which a second response will be much, much more aggressive than a first response to that particular antigen. T cells come in two forms. There's the CD8 T cell and CD4 T cell, the CD8 T cell being the cytotoxic or killer T cell, and the um, CD4 being the helper T cell. Um, they um, respond to um, different major histocompatibility antigens. Um, in um, humans, this is a human lymphocyte antigen complex, or HLA. Um, the cytotoxic or killer T cell responds to the class one major histocompatibility antigen, and the helper T cell responds to the class two uh, major histocompatibility complex um, antigen. Um, these are different cells which can be measured, um, as you know, and um, quantified. Immunoglobulins, they like. There is virtually always a question on immunoglobulins. It varies a bit. Often the immunoglobulin question has to do with rheumatoid factor, but it also on occasion um, has to do with immunology. The um, three that they tend to like the most are IgG, IgM, and IgE. Um, IgG is smaller, is contained or binds to uh, macrophages and neutrophils, and is largely a secondary responder. IgM is bigger and is a primary responder, and IgE is associated with mast cells and serves um, an anaphylaxis and allergy. Um, and often, uh, the way they want to know IgE is anaphylaxis. A typical immunoglobulin is a Y-shaped um, uh, protein. It has a heavy chain and a light chain. Important clinically, of course, in multiple myeloma where these are measured. Um, if one measures serum proteins, you usually are measuring heavy chains. And you have to remember that 20% of myelomas are light chains and they're measured in the urine. Um, so that people who present looking like myeloma with nor normal serum proteins may well have um, myeloma. Um, and what you're measuring is an immunoglobulin made by the plasma cell. Complement is a system that uh, amplifies the action of the immunoglobulins. Currently thought to be approximately 25 proteins. Um, they're made in the liver and circulate. Activation of complement results in a membrane attack complex which destroys the cell. There are two complement um, pathways, the classical pathway and the alternate pathway. They both end up at the same place, and they activate this ca cascade um, of complement, which eventually results in um, a channel or a disruption of the cell membrane and death of the cell. As you all are aware, it is um, seen in inflammatory diseases commonly um, looked at, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Cytokines have become more and more and more popular um, on the um, in-training exams. Um, even though there is much not known and we're a large degree in the infancy of learning about cytokines, they're proteins that are secreted in response to antigens. They're secreted by T lymphocytes. They regulate immune and inflammatory responses. Um, examples are interferons, growth factors, colony stimulating factors, and interleukins. Um, and interleukins and interferons and growth factors are being used um, clinically um, and will be a growth area in biology as y'all's careers progress. Transplantation, um, allograft transplantation is transplantation between uh, two organisms of the same species, xenograft transplantation between organisms of different species. Um, 
As you know, most of the time when we transplant dead bones, we um, don't pay a lot of attention to histologic or to histocompatibility typing, even though there is um, significant laboratory data suggesting it might help. But freezing markedly diminishes the cellular response to a foreign bone, and that's largely how we get away with transplanting bones that that are immuno immunologically non-compatible. Freeze drying overwhelmingly um, diminishes the um, cellular response so that if you are doing large fragment frozen transplants um, generally used to try to preserve some cartilage or soft tissue, uh, you will see in a few people a immune response where you just watch that transplant melt away over a period of months and years. Fortunately uncommon. With freeze-dried bone, like we all commonly are, are using um, in, in procedures like cervical fusions, that type of immune response is exceedingly uncommon and not likely to be seen often. Cancer is a disorder of uncontrolled cell growth. It uh, involves damage to the DNA. This can involve mutations, deletions, or um, translocations. Uh, there are uh, several um, concepts that they like to ask about. Oncogenes are genes that encourage cell transformation and promote um, un uncontrolled growth. And there is an oncogene, the MDM2 gene, that is found, if measured, in up to a third of all bone and soft tissue sarcomas. Tumor suppressor gene is the one they tend to like to ask about the best. Um, it inhibits cell transformation so that having tumor suppressor genes by and large is good. The common one uh, that is asked about is the retinoblastoma gene. And it shows up at least every other year and would certainly um, not be an unexpected question. P53 is the other tumor suppressor gene that gets asked about. The retinoblastoma gene is important for osteosarcoma. Um, uh, the incidence of osteosarcomas is significantly increased, as well as other tumors, if there's loss of one colony of the retinoblastoma, one copy of the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor gene. Uh, metastases um, are obviously a clinical entity that you will see regularly in practice. Um, and it's a fascinating biological phenomenon. Um, tumors are heterogeneous. Not every cell in a tumor may metastasize. The metastasis, consequently, may not look exactly like the, um, the primary tumor did. But for a tumor to metastasize, it has to undergo a lot of biological activities that it's not easy for cells to undergo. The cell has to transform and proliferate it then has to be able to elaborate a blood supply and survive in its new environment. It has to elaborate enzymes that allow it to transgress the vessel wall and get into the blood vessel. It then has to survive, um, flow through the circulation with all of the um, macrophages and, and other immunologic cells that might not um, recognize it as normal. It has to be able to attach to a vessel wall, elaborate enzymes that allow it to perforate the vascular wall, go to a new location, and be able to elaborate a blood supply and multiply and live there so that there are a lot of improbable biochemical um, processes that go on in an effort for a metastasis to um, be successful, um, which explains to some degree uh, that metastasis is not really a time-limited type of phenomenon. You see some people clinically who've had their tumor for years and years um, with multiple recurrences and never metastasizes, and other people who show up right away uh, with um, metastatic disease at the time of presentation, which is just a representation of the different ability of these cells to... Um, to biologically be able to go through all of these processes. And we are now 
going to go to perioperative problems. I'm not sure which order that is. I, I tried to um, figure out the way they were numbered today and couldn't. And they all start at one. Each new section starts with a number one. So I couldn't tell you that the first thing was on one and the next one's on 12. Um, I'll give you a minute to, um, to find that. Perioperative problems, um, thank heavens, is a um, basically clinical talk, even though it is in the um, basic science um, section of the uh, Miller Review book. Um, I, by and large, in putting these together, not having done it before, tried to stick with the organization of the Miller Review book and heavily used the um, Academy book on basic sciences in orthopedics. It, it's hard uh, for me to imagine that they're going to all the trouble to publish that book and not uh, use it as a major source. And at least on the last three or four years of in-training exams, virtually all of the basic science questions have been covered um, in one form or another um, in there. Um, fat embolism syndrome. Um, certainly you've all seen it um, located in universities. You're used to dealing with major trauma. Um, it's one of those entities that um, has to be paid attention to very carefully. As an orthopedist, uh, you may be more attuned to it sometimes than the general surgery residents and interns who are taking care of your patients in the intensive care units. Um, and it, it seems to me, just watching a couple of universities, that there's a tendency of orthopedic residents to defer to the um, general surgery um, uh, people who are taking care of the sick ICU patients, but there are some things that you guys recognize better than they do. And certainly fat embolism syndrome that I'm going to mention briefly, and especially compartment syndromes that I'm not going to be talking about today are entities that as you go into practice, um, you need to really pay attention to because other specialists don't tend to be as attuned to, um, to those things as orthopedists do. Fat embolism is a um, syndrome of pulmonary distress, mental status changes, and a petechial rash that occurs sometime after generally pelvic or long bone fractures. The usual time course is a day or two um, after the fractures. Um, Although you will watch, if you watch the anesthesia monitor, uh, fat embolism syndromes occurring while you're doing intramedullary nailing and hip replacements at times. So um, the, the syndrome is not only clinically applicable to um, people who come in with long bone fractures. It occurs in half to 3% of people who have one long bone fracture, Multiple fractures increase the incidence so that in patients um, with two femurs broken, the incidence is up to about a third of patients will have it. It has a huge range of clinical um, significance from people who just drop their saturations a little and are never sick up to people who become deathly ill with it. As many as 15% of people who have the clinical syndrome um, will um, end up dying of the problem. So it, it is something that you want to recognize, uh, be aware of, and initiate treatment for. There are a couple of thoughts of what the etiologies of fat embolism syndrome are. Uh, one is the mechanical um, pathway in which it's felt that fat that is released at the time of trauma from the bone marrow obstructs um, blood vessels. Large globules um, will go into the lung and stay there, obstructing lung capillaries. Smaller globules may pass through the um, lung vasculature 
and make it into the um, systemic circulation and obviously um, are responsible for uh, situations like the mental status changes in skin lesions. The other thought on fat embolism is the biochemical uh, and inflammatory uh, cascade. It's thought that the fat gets metabolized to free fatty acids in the vessels. The um, free fatty acids are irritants and create a severe inflammatory response, uh, leading to the development of capillary leakage of fluid, bleeding, blood clot formation, and ultimately um, adult respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, the people who favor the inflammatory cascade think that the time period to metabolize the fat to free fatty acids may explain the usual 24 to 48 hour symptom delay that is seen in people post-trauma. Clinically, uh, it presents as respiratory distress. People have hypoxia, tachypnea, and may develop in severe um, instances the snowstorm chest x-ray where both lungs look basically whited out. Cerebral signs include confusion, drowsiness, um, and convulsions, and lesions can be seen um, in the brain on MRI in these patients. Uh, the skin petechiae um, also are seen um, often in areas that you don't necessarily look very hard at, uh, like under the axillae. Uh, there's virtually always a fat embolism question. Um, uh, the um, treatment is hydration and respiratory support. Uh, steroids are not generally advocated, but are still used on occasion uh, in very severe um, circumstances where the um, intensivist um, reaches a point of feeling they have to do anything. But in general, it's not a first-line treatment. If the disease is recognized early, and the patients are treated with support, uh, the prognosis is good. In people with severe, uh, the severe syndrome or in whom it's not recognized and treated, uh, as noted, there's about a 10% um, mortality rate. The other vascular issue that is always asked about and should always be asked about of course, is thromboembolic disease. It is, at least in the institutions that I work in, essentially epidemic. Um, it, it is an unusual M&M um, uh, &M conference where somebody on one of our services hasn't been treated um, for DVT or pulmonary emboli. Um, it, in unprotected patients, which most of the time shouldn't occur. Um, this should be historical numbers for most of us, I hope. Uh, the incidents are astronomical. 70% in hip replacements, 80% in knee replacements. One of the saddest m and &M conferences you can go to is watching a poor sports medicine guy talking about a knee arthroscopy patient having a um, pulmonary embolus, and obviously you're not going to prophylax them, but it occurs even in these little innocuous 12-minute chibble away a piece of knee cartilage procedures. So this is something that is going to happen to you. You need to be aware of and um, watch for. Older people with hip fractures, um, another group that is going to escalate in numbers astronomically and most of you are going to treat these patients and most of you are going to, um, to deal with some of these patients. Um, so if you want your practice to be adventurous, uh, don't pay much attention to DVT um, because you, you will see it and it will be adventurous. Um, and it gets complicated, as you all know. People are on all sorts of different drugs now. Virtually every older adult you see, you need to, to be looking into whether they're taking Plavix or aspirin or NSAIDs. Um, and then you have to think about how you're going to prophylax them. And, it, and it's just not easy. Um, it, it's something that you'll spend a lot of hours agonizing. The coagulation pathway, they ask fairly regularly. 
you know, there are two um, systems, the extrinsic system, which is involved in the release of thromboplastin during cell damage, and the intrinsic system, which involves um, contact of um, factor 12 with collagen on damaged vessels, and the fibrinolytic system, um, uh, plasminogen is converted to plasmin, and plasmin um, dissolves um, a clot. So that in the intrinsic pathway, uh, which is measured with the partial thromboplastin time, um, uh, and is therefore a heparin-sensitive pathway, the extrinsic pathway is measured with the prothrombin time, and therefore is a coumadin-sensitive pathway, they eventually end up at the same place. Um, uh, but they have liked off and on to ask about um, heparin and um, coumadin and where their mechanisms of um, action are. They both end up um, in a um, common um, pathway. Beerchild's triad was on in training, I think, two years ago. Um, certainly a, a fair question. Um, hypercoagulability, venous stasis, and endothelial damage are Virchow's um, triad. The hypercoagulability occurs immediately at the time of surgery or trauma. Um, uh, and um, consequently, um, uh, the ideal prophylaxis occurs prior um, to the event, which is, is reasonably possible in elective surgery, but obviously not going to happen in trauma. Risk factors for DVT uh, is another popular concept, and one that just to um, keep your practice pleasant, you have to be um, aware of. Uh, the intrinsic factors, older people are more likely, a prior history of DVT, um, abnormal vasculature, um, malignancy, and all of you who go into general orthopedics, most of you who do joint replacements are going to deal with patients who um, have malignancies and is something that you need to keep in mind. Oral contraceptives, um, uh, congestive heart failure, smoking, and obesity. Uh, extrinsic factors include um, increased blood viscosity, uh, more trauma results in a higher likelihood, immobility, and um, paralysis. Um, and it seems to me that in our M&M conferences, every six months or so, we get somebody presented that was in a cast um, and gets pulmonary embolus. Um, uh, if you're dealing with spine trauma or in a spinal cord injury center, uh, it's a very common problem that you're going to have to be aware of and deal with. Um, diagnosis is not um, uh, necessarily perfectly easy. Physical exam diagnosis is very inaccurate and they tend to like to make sure that you know that looking at things like swelling and Hohmann signs and the like um, is not a dependable way to make the diagnosis. Um, venography is the gold standard. Uh, it is invasive, it's expensive, uh, there are people who can't have the contrast material, so there are people that you're just not able to do venography on. Doppler ultrasound is uh, basically as good as your location. If you have um, very good um, ultrasonographers, it is reasonably good. Wonderful for calf veins, very good for thigh veins, not too good for pelvic veins where a lot of the big clots um, occur. Fibrinogen labeled impedance plethysmography is basically a, um, uh, a test of antiquity. Um, it's um, not easy to do. It has a low sensitivity and specificity. Pulmonary embolism, um, you've all seen Classic presentation is chest pain and dyspnea. People are tachypneic and tachycardic. Ideally, they have a low PO2, but 15% of people with pulmonary emboli will have a PO2 greater than 85, so that it's not always easy. Electrocardiogram changes, which I don't think they will ask you about specifically, 
but which they sometimes include in the way they ask the question, include right axis deviation or right bundle branch, branch block, uh, ST wave depression, T and T wave inversion, um, and increased P waves. EKG changes occur in about 25% of people, so when they are there, they are useful. When they are not there, um, they do not in any way um, rule out the possibility. Uh, valuation methods include VQ scanning, which has been the standard um, that most of us have used until more recently. It can detect a two centimeter area of reduced perfusion, um, which um, is reasonably sensitive, but certainly not um, absolutely sensitive. Uh, by um, using uh, inhaled labeled microaerosols, the um, test can be made um, more sensitive. Angiography is and has been the gold standard. It's expensive, it's invasive, it's an aggravation to get in somebody who's already sick, uh, but it will show vessel occlusion up to about two and a half millimeters in size. Smaller vessels it will miss. The currently seemingly most popular technique in most places is the spiral CT scanner, uh, which is certainly easier uh, to get and easier on the patient. Uh, than angiography and appears in good hands and that's what you've got to know. You know, not everybody is going to have um, radiologists who are very good at this, but in good hands appears to have superior sensitivity to VQ scanning. The classic treatment, which is what they are probably going to um, be asking about, is heparin uh, for approximately a week, measured by measuring the PTT. It's an antithrombin-3 inhibitor, followed by Coumadin for at least three months, uh, measured by measuring the protime. Uh, it's a vitamin K epoxide and reductase inhibitor. Um, certainly, the low molecular weight heparins are becoming more and more um, popular and widely used. But in all likelihood, the classic treatment is going to be what's expected on the in-training. People who are on the boards, people who are um, treated have up to a 10% recurrence over a 12-month period of time. So that a prior history of DVT, a prior history of pulmonary emboli is a risk factor that you have to keep in mind in dealing with people. Respiratory distress syndrome is pulmonary edema in the absence of volume overload or heart failure. Um, it's seen commonly after trauma in an orthopedic practice. Uh, we would see it less commonly um, in these other circumstances, but certainly we see people who are septic on a too regular basis. Uh, so that um, it is an entity that needs to be watched for. This one is opposed to fat emboli, your general surgery residents um, who are helping in the ICUs and your general surgeons when you get out into the world are going to be more attuned to, but nonetheless, if you're following these patients, these are things that you need to think about. ARDS starts off nearly asymptomatic and is easy to miss. Patients may have a slight tachypnea and dyspnea, a low-grade hypoxemia, which progresses and can progress rapidly uh, with a mortality that can reach up to 40 to 60 percent. Um, as orthopedists, we can uh, mitigate this by stabilization of long bone fractures, um, which doesn't necessarily mean um, intramedullary nailing of everything. It may, in some deathly ill patients, mean putting external fixators on under local anesthesia and intensive care unit just to stabilize, um, especially femur fractures. Uh, but, but the orthopedic ability to uh, practically uh, mitigate this is stabilization of long bone fractures. You're not likely anywhere to be the primary ICU treater of this. Um, nutrition is um, uh, popular. Um, it um, 
is asked usually in a form that only is trying to see that you recognize that nutrition is important. As many as 50% of surgical patients and even more elderly patients will be malnourished. Um, the malnourishment affects wound healing, immune responses, and the ability to prevent and fight infections. Um, can be picked up with weight loss or measurement of albumin or transferrin, and these people will sometimes um, lose um, their energy or will be, be allergic to skin tests. Um, in the ICU setting where you are very likely to encounter it, um, it is possible to diminish this problem with tube feedings. The lack of enteral feeding leads to atrophy of the intestinal mucosa and translocation of intestinal bacteria into the, um, the circulation. Um, enteral feeding will diminish the likelihood of this. Uh, remember that nutritional requirements are dramatically increased uh, uh, in entities that you will treat, including surgery, trauma, uh, infection, um, and in, at least in orthopedics to a lesser degree, um, burns. Um, and generally, the burn patients you see will have a burn surgeon or a, a general surgeon who's watching that. And just to try to wake everybody um, up um, after an hour, nearly hour of um, nonstop talking. Do you all want to stretch for the first few minutes? Yeah, if, if I have, well, let's try to be back in five minutes. So we got another hour to go this morning and y'all been sitting a long time. Sorry. Is there any studies yet that shows that uh, any prophylaxis for uh, DDT has decreased the rate of fatal pulmonary injuries specifically? Oh, you know, that's a million dollar question, you know, and, and the problem is probably that much, and people have, would have to collect 30,000 patients to, right. to get it to reach true statistical significance, so it's crystal clear that the numbers of emboli are diminished. Uh, it is not statistically
Somebody asks people out front to start coming back in if they want to. Um, All right, um, my, my goal for the morning, which we may or may not accomplish, is to finish imaging an infection and spend both hours this afternoon on the joints chapter, which um, is clearly the longest and I think um, in terms of numbers of questions and practicality, the, the most important and inclusive of the, um, the chapters that I was asked to uncover. Um, imaging and special studies um, is going to be a um, fairly quick overview of such things as bone scanning, MRI scanning, bone density measurements, and a uh, very little bit of electromyography. Uh, the bone scan is something that all of you will order on a regular basis. Um, it is a representation of increased blood flow um, to bone and of bone metabolism. The commonly used um, radiopharmaceutical is technetium phosphate. Um, those complexes are absorbed into the hydroxyapatite crystal in areas of increased bone turnover. Um, bone scans, as you all know, are quite sensitive, but unfortunately quite nonspecific, so that they show tumors, infections, fractures, metabolic diseases, uh, and the like, and obviously all you see is a little black spot on an x-ray you will find as you get out treating patients and talking to patients and families that they expect much more. They come in with a bone scan like they're holding a Medal of Honor and believe that, boy, that thing ought to tell you everything you could ever imagine wanting to know about them. Um, and you will spend a lot of time explaining the physiology of bone scanning to intelligent patients um, that you have. Um, it's generally done in three phases. Uh, there's a dynamic phase, a blood pool phase, and a static phase. Uh, the dynamic flow or the arteriogram phase is uh, very early, the first couple of minutes of the um, test. And the scanner will pick up the technetium flowing through the arterial system. The blood pool phase is done approximately five minutes afterwards. Um, nothing magic about that number. And it um, represents equilibrium in the intravascular space before there's actually been time for bone uptake to occur. Um, so that <clears throat> the um, blood pool phase will show uh, the technetium not only in the arteries but also in the venous system. And then the static phase is done four hours or thereabouts later. Again, there's nothing magic about um, four hours. It's a convenient time that a lot of radiology departments use. Um, I think the example that I'm going to show next was done at three hours. And if it waits eight or ten hours, it certainly doesn't make much difference. The bone scan can be made more useful to you in a couple of ways. Uh, one is to do pinhole collimation where only a very small area uh, is looked at um, much more um, carefully uh, and with um, single photon emission CT scanning which is good for showing the spine and pelvis um, basically areas um, that um, 
are more difficult to interpret um, with um, standard bone scanning. Uh, bear in mind that the material is excreted in the urine and all of you have seen bone scans where the patient has what looks like a big balloon in their bladder and if you're looking at their shoulder that's all well and good. Uh, but if you're interested in their pelvis or sacrum, you need to be sure that the people um, urinate before the bone scan is done. I have seen over the years a couple of instances of pelvic and sacral lesions missed on bone scan because they were behind a full bladder. Uh, this is an example of a patient of mine who um, just happened to have a small cell osteosarcoma of the femur. The um, blood flow arteriogram basically shows flow through the arterial circulation with uptake in his tumor. Uh, his blood pool image, and they didn't tell on the film exactly um, how many minutes later they waited, shows um, residual uptake um, within his tumor in the absence of the arteriogram flow. And then the delayed or static image this particular hospital in Virginia Beach did with a three-hour delay shows some markedly increased uptake in, in that osteosarcoma. And certainly you don't always need all three phases. If you're um, in an area that uses a portable MRI scanner that just doesn't happen to be there that day and you're doing a bone scan to look at a little old lady with hip pain to see if she has a hip fracture, you don't need um, anything but the static phase. Um, in, in other instances, as you just saw in the hand lecture, bone scanning can be used to study blood flow um, reasonably effectively. <clears throat> The bone scan remains positive for a while um, and that will become important as you practice clinically. Um, <clears throat> the first phase is positive for two or three weeks. Second phase is positive generally for about eight weeks. And the third phase is positive for as long as 24 months or more. If you're looking for an occult fracture, the scan may not become positive for as long as 72 hours so that particularly um, in little old people that you're looking for hip fractures who have very thin bone, if your bone scan is done at 24 hours you may well miss it um, even though it's there. If you're in a big city hospital that has MRI scanning regularly available, you're not going to use it for that but not all of you will be there. PET scanning is another um, popular nuclear medicine um, scanning technique. You are going to see more and more of it. Um, I think the only reasons we are not seeing even more of it now than we are is financial. I think it's in the best interest of the federal government to discourage it because they're expensive and it's certainly in the best interest of the HMOs to discourage it because it's expensive. Basically they use a um, gluco glucose analog, uh, fluorodoxyglucose I believe, um, which is taken up by the cell but it's not metabolized. So that cells that are rapidly turning over um, take up this glucose and keep it inside the cell and it can be measured. Um, commonly used in tumors, um, sarcomas in general um, have um, PET scan uptake although it's not been um, overwhelmingly widely used at this point in time and in my practice it is difficult to get the HMOs to allow it to be used. Gallium scanning and thallium scanning you will use. Um, I think less so now than in years past. Um, MRI scanning has to a significant degree uh, displaced some of these nuclear techniques. Um, gallium scanning <coughs> is not specific for infection. That's generally what we use it for. It's positive in trauma and it's positive in some tumors. Um, the images usually are delayed uh, for about 48 hours so that in people that you're looking for infection who are sick, it's not very practical. 
And in general, it needs to be compared with a bone scan to get the maximum information from it. Where you will probably, I think, use it the most is in combination with thallium scanning, looking at potentially infected joint replacements. Um, MRI scanning is not very useful because of the big metal content. And so a combination gallium-thallium scan is probably the most sensitive way to assess for an infected joint replacement that's not obviously infected. Um, remember from an earlier lecture, aspiration for culture is positive only about 50% of the time, and this is better. There is normal uptake of thallium in bone marrow, but it's not present in other conditions such as trauma and tumors, so that when positive, it's useful. It's a difficult technique, um, and your um, nuclear medicine guy has to be interested in it to, to make it work. If it's not done very compulsively, you will get false negatives. Um, next, I'm going to talk about MRI scanning. Um, you're all going to look at tons of MRI scans. Um, and I think it is useful to you and useful to your patient for you to understand a little bit about MRI scanning in, in looking at the scans. Uh, the amount of money that every one of us in this room just about will spend on MRI scans is probably staggering to, to think about um, into the future. Um, so that um, understanding a tiny bit of how it works, I think, is, um, is useful to you. The origin of the MRI signal is the proton or the hydrogen nucleus, found most commonly in fat and water. And the classic sequences that we're going to talk about, which are not necessarily uh, the most commonly used sequences, um, involve the T1-weighted image looking at fat and the T2-weighted image looking at water. Um, it is accomplished by applying a radio frequency pulse, which gets these um, proton spinning, and then the, um, that is measured. The signal can be amplified by applying a second radio frequency pulse uh, to give um, a um, better uh, picture, and that's called a spin echo sequence. The TE, which you're going to see, TEs and TRs we're going to talk about, basically is twice the interval between pulses, so the TE would basically be this length of, of time. T1 is a longitudinal relaxation time. Uh, it is the time constant of the growth of magnetism and measures how quickly a tissue gains magnetism. Now this is my cartoon, which may not be um, perfectly um, accurate in terms of um, magnitudes, but is useful to me. When, when you're doing a T1-weighted image, you are using a short TE and a short TR time. So that if you put that down in this area, there is a big difference between the tissues. If you come farther out and measure it up in here when all of the tissues are reaching equilibrium, there is a much smaller difference um, in what gets measured. So that in looking at T T1s, these are done relatively um, quickly uh, between pulses, um, and, and that is the reason for it. T2s are a time constant of uh, decay uh, following the radio frequency pulse. And T2s have long TEs and long TRs. And of course, there's a bunch of different things in between, but with T2s, as these, um, uh, as the spinning decays, if you measure it quickly, they're all spinning very rapidly, and so you won't get much difference. But if you bring the measurement farther out, then there's a big difference in, in the um, decay of the pulse, and that's why T2s are done uh, with long time intervals. The problem, of course, with T2 is it takes a while to collect. And your radiologist and your hospital administrator absolutely don't want that. 
and you get tired of your patient coming in and saying, God, I was on the MRI machine for two hours. Um, and so the classic T2 weighted image is something that you will not see as much of as was done early in MRI sequencing because there are other ways to gather the information. But it's still the classic and still what is asked about. So the TE is the time to echo, um, which as I point out is the time between the pulses. Uh, the TR is the time to repetition. The longer you wait to, to repeat the pulses, the more of the tissue it has come back down to um, equilibrium. Weighted images, I point out T1 is short TRs and short TEs. Um, and it basically looks best at fat. It is very useful and probably the best pulse sequence for looking at anatomical planes. There are only a few tissues that are high signal intensity or bright or white for orthopedic residents, uh, but when you're talking to a radiologist and you want to sound intelligent, you should talk about high and low and intermediate signal intensities. The things that are high signal intensity on T1 are fat, subacute bleeding, proteinaceous fluid, and if you really want to sound brilliant with your radiologist melanin, but, but not something that you're likely to deal with orthopedically, but the other things you do. You deal with fat planes, you deal with bleeding, and you deal with abscesses and the like that may have proteinaceous fluid in them. T2-weighted images have long TRs and, and long TEs, and consequently take a long time to get. Fluid is high signal intensity on T2s. So they're commonly used to look for things like tumors, infections, edema that you might get with an injury. Um, and, and fat remains high but not as high signal intensity on T2 as T1. There are some tissues that it doesn't matter which pulse sequence you use. They have the same signal intensity on both. Cortical bone is always low signal or black on both T1 and T2 weighted images. Consequently, MRI is not really a particularly good study if all you want to look at is cortical bone. Ligament um, is always low signal intensity on T1 and T2 weighted images. So that a normal ligament looks black, an injured ligament doesn't though. There will be areas of higher intermediate signal intensity within that and it's very useful as you know at looking at ligament injuries. Articular cartilage tends to be intermediate or gray. A uh, red marrow tends to be of intermediate signal intensity, and you will see this a lot. And it kind of, if you don't recognize it, will drive you crazy. You're looking at the bone marrow, you think it ought to look white, and all of a sudden here's this bunch of gray stuff in the bone marrow. And that is red or hematopoietic marrow um, replacing or never having been totally replaced fatty marrow. Old blood, subacute blood is high signal intensity on, on both images. Acute blood is low signal intensity on um, T1 so that if it's blood and it's high signal, it is not an acute hemorrhage. Other tissues have different signal intensities on MRI and these you have to recognize. It is a very common question to ask what the expected signal intensities of a soft tissue sarcoma are on MRI, which is low T1, high T2. Um, that occurs with osteomyelitis, which arguably is similar kinds of tissue as the um, tumors are. Uh, marrow edema or fluid tends to be low T1 and high T2. Um, fat is high T1 and not quite as high T2. Uh, pus is um, intermediate signal intensity because it's proteinaceous fluid. And remember, proteinaceous fluid is one of the things that can be high signal intensity on T1 and it's high signal intensity on, on T2. And you need to be able to recognize some of those things when you're looking at, at MRIs. You're going to look at these things um, 
after hours or before radiologists come into work, and you're going to need to be able to think about them. Spinal MRI scanning obviously is used all of the time. You're in almost any general orthopedic or spine practice, you're going to be looking at these. It is the best imaging test for disc space infections. Um, degenerative disc disease or discogenic sclerosis tends to have a low signal intensity on T2, tends to have a high signal intensity, or um, tumors would have a high signal intensity on T2. Uh, the other thing that I didn't mention, I guess the spine lecture must have, is hemangiomas or a dime a dozen in the spine. Again, if you think about the pathology, you can guess the signal intensity. Hemangioma pathology is fat in blood vessels. It consequently tends to be relatively high signal intensity on both T1 and T2 weighted images, whereas metastatic carcinomas that you're often differentiating them from will not be high signal intensity on T1 because they don't have fat in them. And so these are things that you're going to use and, and are going to need to think about. Recurrent disc infections, um, much like you use contrast-enhanced CTs, you can use contrast-enhanced um, MRI scanning with gadolinium. SCAR has uptake because it's vascular. The fragments of disc tend not to. Um, bear in mind, and it's going to drive you nuts in a general orthopedic or spine practice, that in the numbers fuzzy, 25% is a commonly used number, but it goes up a little from there in other studies. 25% of perfectly healthy, asymptomatic medical students who swear they never had a backache in their life have an abnormal spine MRI. And you try to convince a work comp person who has a radiology report in his hand that calls his, calls his MRI abnormal, that that doesn't necessarily mean that's the source of his backache, and you'll be talking longer than I'm going to talk today. And, and, but you have to bear in mind that, that that is a problem. Gadolinium is commonly used. It's not used all the time. Uh, if you are in a big city practice with a huge radiology group with lots of experienced people, you won't even have to think about it. But if you're in small town southwest Virginia, you may be the one who has to think about whether gadolinium ought to be given or not, and you ought to know the indications for it. It's used in masses to determine a cyst from a solid. Um, it's used in masses to determine viable tumor from necrotic tumor. And if you're thinking about biopsying tumors, you need to look at that and see where the necrosis is because if you biopsy a necrotic area, the pathologist is going to be no help. Used in infection to differentiate abscess, which doesn't have gadolinium uptake, from inflammatory tissue, which does have gadolinium uptake, and is noted earlier in the spine to differentiate disc from, from scar. Um, Orthopedic resident, um, classic, you know, strong as a bull and twice as smart. Um, we're going to talk about CT scanning next. And CT scanning has some numbers associated with it. MRI scanning does two TEs and TRs. But remember Helmsfield units with CT scanning. Uh, minus 100 is air, zero is water, plus 100 is cortical bone. Stuff in between is stuff in between, so that between minus 100 and zero, you have fat and vascularized fat. Um, and, and you can get some help looking at those numbers. Um, computed tomography is your best test uh, for getting uh, cross-sectional imaging of cortical bone. If you are suspecting an osteoid osteoma, for instance, uh, computed tomography may well show that better than MRI. Also used in chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, those of you who work up patients for tumors will order lots of chest and abdomens. Those of you who do trauma will order lots of pelvis CTs. Uh, useful, um, particularly pelvic trauma, but but other um, instances of trauma. 
Uh, while MRI may be better now for a tibial plateau fracture, you may be in an area where there's not MRI available for that and may be using it for articular fractures. It's good in the foot looking at tarsal coalitions. It's good for looking at cervical stenosis. Um, and is useful in biopsies, and over your careers, you're going to order a fair number of CT-guided biopsies in all likelihood. There are a number of instances, especially in the spine, where biopsy under CT guidance is easier than open. Ultrasound, um, I tell my radiologist, is their secret weapon. Uh, for most orthopedists, they can show us an ultrasound and tell us anything, and, and we are stuck with believing it. We don't see them that much and aren't as comfortable um, with them. It's not used nearly as commonly as CT and MRI scanning are used. Um, it is useful ro for rotator cuff tears. It's useful in looking at hip dysplasia and for looking for um, fluid-filled bursal sacs. Um, I use it all the time for biopsy of soft tissue masses. Uh, the radiologist can tell the areas that are vascular from the areas that are uh, necrotic and can get needle biopsies of soft tissue masses uh, from areas and is commonly used, also used to assess hematomas and abscesses and for um, drainage procedures. Bone densitometry is another one of those things that they like, they're going to ask about, you're going to have to know it. And on top of learning it for the test, anybody in any adult practice is going to have to know it. And you're going to have to understand it and you're going to have to be conversant with it that, with patients that come into your office because lots of patients are smart and lots of them know about this stuff. And you just don't get away with having your little old lady with a hip fracture come in and say, well, you know, go talk to your internist about that. I don't get into that. Uh, it, it doesn't work. So bone densitometry, you're going to need to think about. It's actually easier now than it was five or ten years ago when you had to fret about all these tests I'm going to show you. Anymore, you really only have to think about DEXA scanning. Whoops. Um, Uh, bone densitometry has a standard measurement. Um, each standard deviation of bone mineral density below the young adult bone density increases your fracture risk by two or three times. Now, in the DEXA scan study you're going to look at, they give you an age match control, but the age match control is not what's used to predict fracture risk. You can look at your 90-year-old lady and say your bone looks good for 90 years old, but if she's still two standard deviations below the young adult mean, she is still six to ten times as likely to get a hip fracture. So less than one standard deviation below the young adult mean is normal. One to two and a half standard deviations is osteopenia. Greater than two and a half standard deviations is osteoporosis, World Health Organization measurements. There are a variety of tests that are largely of historical interest. Um, single photon and dual photon absorpsiometry are um, nuclear medicine techniques in which they use photons with either one or two energy levels. Uh, they, take a they have a long exam time. Uh, the image resolution isn't good, and they're largely not, not used. Quantitative CT is used. Um, it is a good measurement, probably the best measurement of trabecular bone. Uh, patient is CT, generally lumbar spine, but any area can be. The radiologist has phantoms of known density that they compare the the measurements too, it's very precise, it's very expensive, and there's a high radiation dose uh, involved with it. DEXA scanning is currently what you're most likely to bump into. There is a lower radiation dose, it's quicker, it's easier to schedule, and is in most places going to be the um, tests that you see. In DEXA scanning, you get a report. It's dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. You get a report that looks like this. And they measure the bone mineral density in grams per centimeter squared. In general, as you go from L1 to L3, the density goes up. 
it tends to drop a little bit as you go down to L4. In this particular patient, there was a large rise. This is out of a recent article in the Blue and Gold Journal that some of y'all may recognize the picture. And she happened to have an L3 compression fracture, and so this is a bit aberrant. This particular person has pretty good bone mineral density. She's up at 90-ish percentile of the young adult mean, and in her age matched is actually um, very high. But in, in this, they will show you where the patient is both graphically and numerically and percentage-wise in terms of the young adult mean, and that's what you use in determining the patient's fracture risk. Most of you will probably not end up being the primary treaters. It seems that I can get away with explaining the test to people and telling them if they want to, if, if they need to go on the medication that is a chronic long-term medicine and their internist ought to do that, but you're going to be asked to interpret these. Elect finally, uh, believe it or not, electrodiagnostic studies um, were talked about a little bit in the hand lecture, and this will be uh, slightly repetitive, but only three or four slides worth of it. Uh, there are several things that are looked at in electrodiagnostic studies. The latency is the time from stimulus to the onset of the response. The amplitude is the height of the response, which basically is reflective of the um, numbers of axons that are responding. Velocity is measured. Myelinated nerve fibers uh, generally have velocities of 40 to 70 meters per second. Non-myelinated nerve fibers are not nearly as fast with velocities of only 5 to 10 meters per second. And this part of the test is, was talked about earlier, is used for compression neuropathies. There are a couple of late responses that I'm not sure I have seen on the test, but were prominently um, talked about in the TAN journal, Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons recently, and so I would think would be fair game. The F wave and the S wave. Um, and, and the F wave response, um, it occurs when only a few cells um, have their impulse go the wrong direction. They head distal rather than proximal. Um, only a few normal um, responders can overwhelm the ability of the machine to pick this up. Um, the distance traveled is so long that often a focal lesion is not found and it can be picked up in diffuse polyneuropathies. The H wave you may bump into. Um, it is a reflex that is picked up only in the soleus. It is used to determine S1 radiculopathies and a sophisticated electromyographer, if you're sending him a lumbar spine with numbness into the bottom of the foot, will look at the H wave it assesses the whole nerve as opposed to only the motor aspect of the nerve, which the motor EM, or which the uh, needle EMG does. The um, electromyographers also look at the response of muscles uh, electrically. Insertional activity is measured when they um, insert a needle into the muscle, move it, and measure the response. Decreased activity is seen with atrophy and fibrosis. Increased activity is largely a um, soft finding, but can be seen in denervation and myopathies. And spontaneous activity is looked at when the needle is inserted into the muscle and not moved to irritate the muscle. Fibrillations are single muscle fiber discharges. Uh, early on in a person who has a um, nerve injury with um, neuropathic muscles, the amplitude will be relatively large. As the muscle fibrosis and the number of axons measured get smaller, the amplitude decreases. Sharp waves uh, are denervation potentials. Um, you can't see these clinically. Uh, complex repetitive discharges are um, a combination of complex waveforms that occur in chronic um, problems. Fasciculations you do see clinically. Those are patients that come into your office and you can see their muscle twitch. 
Uh, it is um, generally generated in the anterior horn cell or possibly distally. You see it in motor neuron diseases such as ALS. It can be seen in benign processes, radiculopathies, neuropathies. Um, you've all, well, I don't know whether y'all have seen much of them or not. Um, muscle relaxers, um, uh, the, the commonly used muscle relaxers used to give everybody fasciculations and um, a number of people post-op would ask why they were so sore. You've seen this exact slide. Um, we both obviously took it from the same article. It's already been explained this morning. Um, in a nerve injury, um, you start to get little sharp waves. As the um, nerve is re innervated from adjacent nerves, uh, you will get these increased polyphasics. The polyphasics are good, the sharp waves are bad. The sharp waves represent denervation, the polyphasics um, represent re innervation on the um, EMG. Uh, recruitment is a test that is used by electromyographers uh, to assess um, effort, basically. Uh, and they will stick a needle and ask the person to um, try to fire the muscle. Um, if someone has so-called central recruitment, there are fewer motor units firing than you would expect, but the speed is normal or slow. This can be seen in people who are too painful to um, try very hard or in people who don't want to try very hard. Uh, reduced recruitment, there are reduced numbers of units firing rapidly and that is um, pathologic and is not seen in people who are not making an effort. A summary of electrodiagnostic um, findings. Um, amplitude gets decreased with virtually everything that causes an um, injury to the nerve. Um, distal latency is decreased in demyelinating uh, diseases. Conduction velocity you generally are using to um, look at a nerve entrapment syndrome such as cubital tunnels and carpal tunnels. Fibrillations are, are um, bad, they are not normal and are seen in virtually all of the diseases that cause um, uh, significant injuries um, to the nerve. And we will get partially through infections uh, this morning and we'll finish um, this afternoon. Um, I've got 25 minutes left and this has generally been taking about 45 minutes. So we will get through part of this but not through um, all of it. Um, I was planning to spend Wednesday night and Thursday morning finishing up the talk and I ended up operating all night Wednesday and again Thursday morning. So I got my daughter to scan some cartoons in for me. Dr. Um, Miller said I had to have cartoons that you guys couldn't stand it without it. And we missed the um, caption on this one, but she did a good job by and large. The caption is sandwiches. Um, and Really, of all the heartbreaking things that, that happen to you regularly in an orthopedic practice, infections may be it. Because whether it's your fault or not, deep down you wonder about it. And deep down your patient wonders about it. Most are very gracious. But you kind of feel like the sandwich with that little staph epidermidis chewing away at you in every patient you have that gets infected. There are a bunch of different orthopedic infections. There is no possible way to cover that in a short um, lecture like this, um, but we're going to um, make some effort to, to do as much as we can. Superficial infections, again, uh, there was an article recently in the TAN Journal which to me means it's fair game uh, in which they talked about soft tissue infections. The classics are erysipelas in the epidermis. Erysipelas is a red, superficial, well-demarcated area that looks inflamed. 
The next deeper infection that, that um, seems to be popularly considered is cellulitis, which is in the fat below the dermis. It is more diffuse. It's also an erythema to skin reaction, but it doesn't tend to be discrete and localized the way erysipelas does. Necrotizing fasciitis, we all fret and worry about, occurs at the next lower level, and myonecrosis occurs in the muscle deep to the um, deep fascia. And all of these are entities that you are likely to encounter. Um, uh, the necrotizing fasciitis and myonecrosis, if you're near a trauma center, are um, frightening things that you're likely to encounter. Um, the MRI scanning of um, infection um, is often useful. A patient referred to me for consideration of a tumor. Uh, T1 equivalent image that is relatively low signal intensity, but look at all of the hyperemia in reaction, which can be seen with tumor, but isn't usual. And then the more T2 equivalent image showing the high signal intensity within the quadriceps. Again, a lot of focal reaction. Um, but you know, sarcomas don't tend to be diffuse. Um, if you have a quadriceps sarcoma, it tends to be in the vastus lateralis or the vastus medialis or the rectus. It, it, the sarcomas are relatively gentlemanly and they tend to respect tissue planes. That's how when you operate with your sarcoma tendings, you know, they're that close to the tumor but they're a fascial plane away and they're happy with it. Uh, infections and carcinomas don't tend to be gentlemanly. They tend to, to violate fascial planes, as this did, rather relatively diffusely involving the muscle. Necrotizing fasciitis usually arises from a skin infection or a traumatic wound. About 60% of people will develop a bacteremia, and a lot of people who develop necrotizing fasciitis die. Uh, you, as an orthopedist, uh, impact this some because you, as an orthopedist, are often the first person who debrides extremity wounds, which is your primary means of preventing this. A single organism occurs only about 10% of the time. In general, it is a multi-organism um, infection. It is more likely to rapidly progress in people who are sick, uh, immunodeficient or malnourished. Remember, malnourished people tend to be immunodeficient. If you're lucky, the x-ray may show gas in the soft tissues, but it certainly does not always. It generally is a group A strep. They produce pyrogenic exotoxins. Um, treatment uh, is resuscitation of the patient and um, surgical debridement uh, from an orthopedic standpoint. Of course, you want appropriate antibiotics and at times may use hyperbaric oxygen. Gascan green is the next level down. It is myonecrosis, occurs in the muscle, not the fascia. Generally associated with traumatic wounds. Prevents with fever, pain, tachycardia, confusion. The drainage usually looks bad. In a minute, we're going to talk about toxic shock in which the drainage doesn't usually look bad. The classic organism is Clostridium, which is an exotoxin-producing gram-positive anaer anaerobic rod. The treatment is initial, adequate, appropriate debridement. And even once it is developed, is adequate, which may mean horrifically extensive debridement, appropriate antibiotics, and possibly hyperbaric oxygen. Toxic shock syndrome is caused by whoops, a toxin of staph aureus or strep, occurs in traumatic wounds. People are sick, they have a fever, hypotension, there's some drainage from their wound, but it doesn't look bad, it looks sort of serous. Um, it is a toxemia, not a septicemia. Uh, primary treatment, again, for all of these things, and what you're going to want to bear in mind is resuscitation of the 
patient and adequate debridement of the um, wound. And uh, of course, appropriate antibiotics, but from an orthopedic perspective, orthopedic testers are going to want you to do appropriate orthopedic surgery. Um, other soft tissue infections include wound infections. Um, you know, it still amazes me when I go into a hospital and somebody, anybody, nurse, resident, internist, says, wow, they have a MRSA infection. At least in the two hospitals that I work in, MRSA is more common than non-methicillin-resistant staph as a, an in-hospital infection. It's unusual for somebody who walks in off the street infected, but of people who acquire their, hospital, their infections in the hospital, methicillin-resistant staph is more common in Richmond and Charlottesville than non-methicillin-resistant staph. Um, marine infections, um, those of you who are practicing near a coast, at some point in time we'll see Mycobacterium marinum as a chronic um, wound on a hand. Often you see it in watermen, but you see it in people who just run crab pots and stuff on their own. Uh, remember, it's hard to culture. And if you don't warn your laboratory that you may be thinking about a mycobacterium, uh, if you don't specifically send a TB sort of culture, you may never grow it. There's a nice chart in the um, book on bites, which I encourage you to look at. Human bites tend to be anaerobic or with Iconella is a question they like to ask. Uh, human bites are relatively nasty. Um, dogs will have um, Pasteurella, but dog bites tend not to be so nasty. Um, cat bites, on the other hand, um, like humans, um, tend to be nasty. Uh, snake bites um, are sometimes associated with Clostridium. Um, those of you who practice particularly in the West, um, snake bites is a big deal. For those of us in the East and Northeast, snake bites aren't such a big deal. They've been keeping records in Virginia since 1939, and there have only been five people die of accidental snake bites, and five of them were people on the Tennessee border who handled them in religious ceremonies. So there have been two accidental snake bite deaths, but those of you in Texas, California, Arizona, uh, Florida, Georgia, where they got big mean snakes, um, rattlesnakes um, that are much bigger than the little copperheads we fool with, um, it's a big deal that necrosis muscle, and you have to worry about a clostridial infection. Osteomyelitis. Um, will get asked in one form or another on every test you ever take. Um, the age and the clinical picture are not necessarily predictive of the organism that you're going to see. Deep cultures and sensitivities are necessary. A superficial culture will mislead you often. A sinus tract culture is not a reliable culture on which to determine definitive treatment. Acute hematogenous osteomyelitis occurs in both children and adults, but more common in children. It um, is a little surprising clinically when you see it in adults, but it occurs. 50% of people that get this are less than five years old, and they are left with permanent sequelae 6% of the time. So this is a real entity that has to be thought about, diagnosed, and treated. It's a blood-borne infection. It's more common in males than females. It's more common in the lower extremities, and it generally is only one bone. It tends to be both metaphyseal and epiphyseal. That becomes important because it can lead to secondary joint infections. The classic, of course, is the hip. Um, when you see a septic hip, the possibility of um, Osteomyelitis of the proximal femur needs to cross your mind. Uh, the physis um, is not much of a barrier to spread of infection for about 15 to 18 months. After that, it tends to limit it at least some. Uh, most of the infections are in long tubular bones. Patients present with fever, pain, and limited use. Unfortunately, lots of them are little tykes that don't talk to you very much, which makes them difficult um, and requires a significant um, 
awareness on your part when a mother tells you, you know, they just don't seem to be moving it very good. It hurts when they move it. Um, they may have swelling and tenderness. If they're at a walking age, they will limp. Said rate at C-reactive protein will tend to be elevated. These kids tend to be good immunologic responders. White count is generally elevated. Blood cultures may or may not be positive. The initial radiology may be nothing more than soft tissue swelling. And the problem with that is you're again operator dependent. If you've got a way over or way underexposed film, you're not going to see soft tissue swelling. Uh, Demineralization uh, is a later finding. Sequestrum and involucrum are um, questions that commonly get asked. The sequestrum is a dead piece of cortical bone that the tumor has surrounded and eliminated, or the infection has surrounded and eliminated the blood supply to. Involucrum is new reactive bone formation, which takes a period of time to begin to occur. Uh, initially subtle, but as time goes by, becomes um, very impressive. Uh, so patient, the, this picture was taken from the Basic Sciences Academy book with a piece of sequestered cortex, and this, which is the sequestrum, and this new periosteal bone formation that you can see here, which is the involucrum. In younger kids, it is much more florid than this. Bone scan is positive, generally after a day or two. Uh, gallium scan, again, takes more radiation in 48 hours to perform. MRI is positive um, almost immediately, um, is very useful in looking at um, deeper areas like the spine and pelvis. Adult hematogenous osteomyelitis is less common. Staph aureus remains the common drug, but it's not what they question. Uh, the, um, while staph is more common in sickle cells, salmonella is the characteristic drug in people on dialysis and IV drug abuse. Pseudomonas is the characteristic drug, and funny joints like the SI joint and the sternoclavicular joint tend to be involved, and they like to question that. Um, Acute osteomyelitis after fracture is generally not hard to diagnose. Treatment is IND. Loose hardware has to be removed. Stable hardware doesn't have to be removed and in fact is advantageous to be left in place very often. Um, and it's treated with incision and drainage, appropriate coverage procedures, sometimes flaps, and appropriate antibiotics. Glycocalyx is a popular question now. Um, Two years ago at the Musculoskeletal Infection Society, they had basically a whole morning devoted to glycocalyx. So you're going to see this. You're going to be expected to, to recognize it. It's a polysaccharide coating that envelops the bacteria and shields it from antibiotics. A glycocalyx commonly forms on orthopedic implants. Um, if you're leaving the implant in place, a lot of people recommend using a scrub brush and scrubbing it in an effort to remove the glycocalyx because antibiotics won't penetrate it. Glycocalyx, though, can also form on biologic materials like the synovial membrane. So when we talk about treating chronic septic joints, a complete synovectomy, anterior and posterior, may be required uh, to to have any likelihood of clearing the infection. Uh, empiric therapies, I'm really not going to talk about too much because they change. This is from the Pink Academy book on basic sciences. Again, the things I think are important here are pseudomonas and nail puncture wounds through the foot. And diabetic foot infections are often polymicrobic, severe infections, not generally a single organism, and require more aggressive treatment. Chronic osteomyelitis um, you will bump into. Um, there is a staging system by George Cerny and John Mater out of um, Galveston, Texas. It is relatively old now, but has stood the test of time. And what's important about this staging system 
is he's broken it down into anatomic type of osteomyelitis and it's been broken down into the host. And what's important about the anatomic type is to think about the extent of your debridement. If you have a medullary canal osteomyelitis, you have to get into the medullary canal to debride it. If you're dealing with a superficial osteomyelitis where there is just a wound overlying an exposed bit of bone, but on imaging studies your medullary canal is normal, you may only need to debride superficially and get coverage. Um, diffuse osteomyelitis involving the whole bone may require creating a segmental defect in the bone to treat, which is very difficult to treat. Uh, long defects often require free fibular or other grafts or bone transport techniques. Short defects generally can be treated without that, with the long and short often being quoted at about six centimeters. The most important part of the Cerny Mater concept, though, I think, was the physiologic class. Um, they broke the host down into three categories an A host, who's normal would be um, uh, a person who has no illnesses whatsoever, a B host who is a compromised host, and it's important to recognize that some people can be locally compromised but look systemically normal, such that a patient who's had radiation therapy is locally compromised and is going to affect your ability to treat that osteomyelitis, but they may look healthy as a horse to you when they walk into the office so that you need to think of host compromise. In general, if you give most people who treat a fair amount of osteomyelitis an A host, they're going to clear it, no matter whether it's medullary, superficial, localized, or diffuse, no matter whether it's draft step, pseudomonas, or whatever. But if you have a compromised host, it's going to be much, much more difficult to clear that, and you need to recognize that with the patient up front. The other thing is it allows you to think about whether there are things you can do to change your host. And if you have a malnourished old lady who's been in a nursing home not eating, you may be able to make her go from a B host to an A host. If you have someone who's had radiation therapy by giving hyperbaric oxygenation or by excising a localized area and doing a flap, you may be able to convert them from a B host to an A host. There are some people in whom the disease process is better than the treatment. And at our VA, we still have people with chronic draining osteomyelitis, particularly of the tibia that dates back to the Korean War. And they're functional and doing fine. And if we lopped out 10 centimeters of tibia, we might never get them back functionally and doing fine. So there are some patients with infections that you just won't, won't bother to treat at all. Um, most of you in big joint replacement centers probably have seen a patient or two or three with an infected hip with a sinus tract that's being treated with suppression because they're too old and too sick to, to undergo what would be take taken what would have to be done to exchange it, and suppression is better than cure in that particular um, circumstance. An example of an acute chron or an adult chronic osteomyelitis showing the x-ray findings of a sequestrum, the, um, the CT findings of a sequestrum. This is a piece of old cortical bone that's been totally isolated by um, granulation tissue and a picture, at least um, here, of involucrum. This is all old involucrum. This thickened cortical bone is new periosteal bone formation. Um, so that you see this um, in, in adults as well as children. Another example of a classic form of osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis forming in a patient with bone infarcts, in this case, uh, a very nice little alcoholic patient of mine who um, has a draining sinus tract coming out to his skin. And to clear this, by and large, requires debridement of, um, of the compromised area, locally compromised area of the um, bone. Chronic osteomyelitis principles are deep cultures appropriate antibiotics delivered either locally or systemically or both, 
uh, common means of local delivery is with polymethyl methacrylate. This is a surface area phenomenon. Beads are better than blocks. Little beads deliver more antibiotic um, to the area than big beads do. Um, Palicose has better elution characteristics than simplex. Um, although I don't think you need to feel guilty if you get into a situation where you want to use it and your cement is simplex, but given the choice, Palicose elutes antibiotics better. They get much higher concentrations of antibiotic for a period of time. Uh, with local delivery than with systemic delivery. Uh, may be uh, an indication in uh, grade 3B open fractures, for instance, as a means of delivering antibiotics, though not perfectly clear. Thorough debridement of necrotic tissues, and that's something we all hate to do. We're in the business of preserving function and having people work and their extremities work well, and taking out whole compartments worth of dead um, muscle is something that's very hard to do, but something that um, with chronic osteomyelitis, usually dealing with bone, and in some people, to, to debride the bone requires creation of a segmental defect. Dead space management is critical. If you take out a large area of tissue and, and leave a void for a hematoma to form in, antibiotics do not get delivered to that. A common usage of antibiotic beads is dead space management. Bone stability, you are more likely to clear it with the bone stable and coverage with either muscle or free flaps. And I will stop here for the morning, and we will pick up the rest of infection this afternoon, and we will do joints this afternoon. And thank you all for your forbearance.